uh, works on structural uh, uh, biochemistry, which means we uh, uh, combine structure and biochemical uh, information, and we work with projects where we you, uh, we try to understand the molecular mechanism of uh, certain uh, 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 problems in protein, and we have used it in two ways. Uh, we develop a lot of biosensors which are protein based uh, and I'm not going to talk about it today but maybe I'll give you an, uh, like a snippet of what we do here but the major part of my talk will be on drug resistance. We already had a talk and we all know how difficult the problem is and I'm going to be discussing most of the uh, time, uh, most of my talk will be on this. Uh, Biosensors, uh, we use proteins and uh, in this case what we have done is we have used proteins where we have come up with sensing uh, for aromatic pollutants like benzene, uh, phenol uh, and uh, other uh, derivatized benzenes and now we are working with biphenyls and going towards PCB detection and we are using bacteria in this case. So we have started with pure protein and made lots of sensors and even come up to a device stage with many of them. And now we are doing uh, both uh, uh, at, the, at the cusp of synthetic biology as well as we, uh, we've been collaborating with, with a lot of material scientists to be able to uh, take it further as a technology and make electrochemical sensors. But um, just this is just to tell you that we were, we, if we use real life cells and using synthetic biology, we were able to make a mixture um, of, uh, we were able to make sensors where we can simultaneously detect multiple pollutants that I've just been mentioning. Uh, so, so that is the work we do with biosensing, but most of the time we are uh, also spending a lot of time in trying to understand drug resistance. So in this aspect, what I uh, would uh, like you to uh, bring your attention is that resistance is something which is a, actually a global, it's a phenomena which is there for the longest time. And if you look, most of the antibiotics that we actually work with, they are actually um, uh, made by uh, organisms which uh, actually uh, also uh, some of them are soil bacteria which produce these antibiotics and they know how to protect. So resistance is actually known uh, for a long time. One of the mechanisms in which it works is this is the ribosome and you can see this is a ribosome is a protein synthesis machine and it's also for the bacteria. So in this case what happens is the, the genetic code in the form of mRNA is read and once this uh, code is read then we have the protein made. So if you don't let the protein be made that is by the uh, action of antibiotics that we see. Then if no protein is going to be made in this particular machine, which is a very large uh, you know, machine that is there in our body, in bacteria, everywhere, then the and most of the antibiotics like erythromycin, streptomycin, you know, you must be uh, uh, taking them on a regular basis when things go wrong. They actually go into this particular, uh, uh, this particular uh, protein synthesis machinery. They stop this process. And you can see, I just want to show you, this is where the protein is coming out. So there's a tunnel. So many of these antibiotics, they actually go and plug the tunnel. So the protein cannot come out. If the protein cannot come out, then you cannot really have the function that you're looking for. So that's what uh, we are actually looking into. We are looking into the class of antibiotics, uh, which go to this molecule that I described, which is the ribosome. And these are the antibiotics, which then go and stop the process I just showed you. And what happens is that in our case, remember the tunnel that where the protein was coming out, antibiotics are, uh, some of the antibiotics are like plugs. They go on and do not let the protein come out. So if the protein cannot come out, then the antibiotic works. But what bacteria do, they're very, very smart. What they do is they go inside this tunnel and methylate at certain conserved positions. They are present in the bacteria, uh, but not in uh, us. And what happens is this small reaction that you see here, this amine group gets monomethylated or dimethylated. And now the, the antibiotic cannot fit there because there is a steric clash. So now what happens is, because of this small modification, the antibiotics, erythromycin, streptomycin, and many other mycins that you were used to be uh, the, uh, working, they stop working. Okay, and this mechanism is what we are looking at. What we are looking at is, how does this methylation actually happen at this position, and can we do something to stop it? Okay, so what we want uh, is the enzyme in the superbugs, which is present, which would actually methylate in certain conditions and can we stop it from actually doing it. The problem is the enzyme that does this 
is a metal transferase. That means it methylates these bases. If you remember DNA sil silencing, there's a lot of methylation. RNA uh, methylation is there. Even ribosome is getting methylated. Even chromatin modeling, there is methylation. And the main donor is f adenosine methionine. So if you come up with inhibitors for something that is very global, you may actually stop different other processes. So you want unique inhibitors. So how do you go about it? What you do is, you say the enzymes, they know everything. The enzymes don't mess up, you know. Uh, methyl transferase, which is a bacterial pathogenic methyl, methyl transferase, it only goes to the ribosome. So this tiny enzyme actually has the information of targeting. And that's what we started looking at, looking at targeting. So we have a methyl transferase, we want to stop its action. Instead of going to the active site, we will go to the targeting site. How does it know it has to go to the ribosome and methylate? How does it not mess up and go anywhere else? That's the question, okay? So we took up two, two methyl transferases, one which was the pathogenic one, one which was a normal methyl transferase required for ribosome folding. And we said, this one knows it has to go to the 30S, this is the green spaghetti, and this one knows it has to go to the blue spaghetti. How does it know? How does this enzyme know? So let's find out how, what we could do about it. So what we did was we looked at both the enzymes, they look like cousins of each other. One only goes to the tunnel site, plug and doesn't allow the antibiotic to plug and this one only goes to the 30S. So we said the information is inside somewhere, although this part of the enzyme which is called the Rossman fold looks very similar and they have these heads and but the mechanism is exactly the same for both the enzymes but they don't cross react. So what uh, Ruchika in my lab a couple of years back did was she uh, figured out the determinants by doing structure, by doing phylogenetic analysis, by looking at dynamics, all this information put together. Uh, we made a lot of chimeras of the protein. That means we took the enzyme which would not methylate the site we wanted, which is this particular enzyme. And we said, can we convert this enzyme into this enzyme? Can we cut pieces of this enzyme and put it here and make it target? We don't want to change the mechanism. Anyway, the mechanism is the same. All you want to do is get the targeting bits, you know, from one enzyme to the other enzyme. And that's what we did. We made a series of uh, chimeras, which means they, they don't look like either of them. And we were able to methylate this site. That means now this enzyme is becoming pathogenic in a way. Not only, so these are the two regions. It's called loop 12, just, you know, some terminology from topology. And this is called loop 1. These two, if you switch the enzyme, which was completely not going and did not do anything with the pathogen, started becoming uh, pathogenic. What I mean, mean is, if you take an enzyme, take E. coli, and you, uh, you put erythromycin, the cells are supposed to die. But if you put this particular uh, uh, protein, which methylates the ribosomes, you see erythromycin, in presence of erythromycin cells grow. Now, again, the starting enzyme, nothing grows because it's not able to methylate the ribosome in that position. However, our chimera, which I was talking about, is now able to do this action to quite a, a large degree. So what we have done is we have come up with some uh, uh, determinants of how does an enzyme decide where it has to go. It has got, in this case, nothing to do with mechanism but other places of RNA recognition. So we wanted to go deeper into it and we know now that it is... Uh, it is these two particular portions of the enzyme which are deciding where it's going to land up in the ribosome. Now what can we do? We looked at the RNA itself where it is going. So we have the protein, we have the RNA, they're going to come together and a methylation event will happen. So we looked at the protein first and now we're looking at how important the 3D structure of the RNA of that position is for recognition. So it's a recognition, pattern recognition problem to put it that way. If the pattern is correct, everything is going to fit and the reaction will happen. So we looked at the RNA and we found that the RNA, um, what this is showing you is this is G and C and A, the basis. And you can see there are some, uh, whenever there is a connection, which is like a Watson and Crick type, you can see that like this. And if there's a bulge, they're coming out. So we mutated or changed all of these bases and figured out the um, in short, let's not even look, go into the data, I, um, just believe me. What we figured out was this orientation where the bulges and where the, uh, uh, where the connections are, are very important. If the, if the 3D architecture of the RNA is not correct, 
then also the protein is unable to recognize it. And this particular problem, uh, what happens is when you have methylation, you have the active site and the base, which is the adenine, it will flip into the active site and methylate. It has to go inside some way. So if it's like this, it has to go inside. So it will methylate. So now this mechanism has been stu uh, studied by fluorescence quite a bit, where people, what they do is they put, take, may take template RNA and put fluorophores and see how the bases are moving. Okay, basically by, by, by monitoring fluorescence. So if suppose I am uh, in an environment which is exposed, uh, fluorescence gets quenched. But when I go inside the protein, I don't have any other bases around me, my fluorescence is enhanced. And that's one way to know that things have gone inside the protein or are interacting with the protein. Let's put it that way. So we did that with many positions, tried to understand where, how the protein is moving, how it is interacting. By looking at fluorescence and stop flow fluorescence, I'll uh, not go into the data, but what I want you to show is we were then able to combine it with MD and were able to show that the places which are moving the most are the places which are, remember there was this loop 12, I told, there is some kind of a recognition which is happening. This is our active site. This is very far away from our active site, 15 Armstrongs. So what I'm trying to tell you is there's a long distance talk, something for the RNA to actually fit it has to fit at different ends of the protein. If you don't allow the fit to happen properly, it's never going to happen. So what, 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 what does this tell me? This, tell me? this tells me from our this whole study is a, a base has to flip inside this pocket and the base has to flip inside this pocket. It's flipping, you can see here. Both these flips are happening together. And if the first flip is not able to happen, the second flip is not able to happen. It is like this they're going to. So they're like this and they go inside the protein like this. Now, if I want to stop the protein from acting, if I stop this side, not the active side, I'm done. Enzyme is going to stop working. So now we have an, something called an allosteric site, which is 15 Armstrongs away from the site of action. Okay. So to confirm that, this was also not experimental and most methyl transferases should work like this, we thought. What we did was we were able to not solve the structure of the other methyl transferase because we need precursor ribosomes for it and we're working on it. We took the other enzyme and Jui in our lab, what she did was she actually solved the uh, cryoEM structure of this protein with the 30S ribosome. So with this work we did in collaboration with uh, Vinod in uh, NCBS and what we figured out here was um, uh, that the same reaction is happening and we wanted to know if there is an experimentally can we see a flip like I was saying like this and like this. Can we see it in, at the ribosome level at least to begin with, with because all uh, methyl transferases ribosomal methyl transferases most likely have this generic mechanism. And so we were able, we, we did uh, uh, cryo-EM and we were able to pick particles, do classification, make 3D structures. And what uh, we found out was, um, uh, I'll actually skip, uh, first I want, I'll skip this and go to the video where we can, I can just uh, uh, explain the whole thing. If it works, yeah. So this is the ribosome and this is the region of the ribosome where uh, um, this protein which is in magenta is actually interacting. And you can zoom into the active site and you can see the protein is like bubble wrapped in RNA. So it's very specific because it needs various positions where it is uh, going to interact with it. But the thing that I want to show you, can you see this double flip that I was talking about? Two bases going in. This is the active site and this is the allosteric site. So now what we have done is, now we are convinced, you know, that this is the way where we can put an inhibitor here and it's going to work. I mean, at least in our minds we are convinced. So then uh, what we have done is we did other tweaking experiments. We, we had ribosomes where we tweaked and changed these bases and proved that this is the interaction. Uh, but uh, what I want to come uh, to here is I'll come directly to what uh, uh, we did the next, we, we did next. So, uh, so here uh, just what we did was we took the enzyme and we wanted to really see how important each of these interactions are. And so we made the helices shorter, longer, mutated the interactions, and then we monitored it by scintillation to see if the methylation is happening or not. And what it told us is how important the recognition process is. So what we figured out was 
there is this real uh, um, catalytic center and this is our the center where the uh, uh, head is and this head is very important in anchoring the enzyme to the right place. So two loops and the head play an important role. But let me come back to my problem. The problem I was trying to work on was uh, can we now develop inhibitors for uh, using our approach. What we have learned here is we have an enzyme and it has an uh, it recognizes the 3D structure of the uh, uh, RNA in the ribosome and there are two sites uh, and one is the active site and one is 15 Armstrongs away from the active site and there is a base flipping that happens which it gets inserted the basis of the uh, of the ribosome in this case gets inserted and if you do not allow this insert to happen then you will not be able to make it. So this is what we did next. We, we decided uh, we will uh, start screening for inhibitors. So we took all the libraries that we could find. For, so we first thought let's not have any bias although we already had it, a bias because we can you can guess what kind of molecules will go in there paste like right but you can still go through and be a little unbiased and come up with uh, uh, with many many screening molecules and um, start with four lakh, a library of 4 lakh and keep on refining your uh, search and what we are looking at is we want only inhibitors that preferentially go to the allosteric site right the one which we have now um, in our minds um, uh, thought to be viable so we did that and unfortunately I think uh, I have not updated my slide but we came up with a couple of scaffolds uh, these scaffolds um, seem to be fitting in this uh, uh, pocket, like layers them. And then what we did was uh, we ordered some of these scaffolds and uh, we, uh, we started screening them. So we, we screened uh, several scaffolds that we picked. And you can see this is a very high um, micromolar uh, screening. So we went from 100 micromolar to 50 and kept on going down in the compounds that we had. And we came up with compounds. Um, currently uh, not shown here but we have come up with less than 5 micromolar uh, hits which are nucleobase analogs and what we have done then is with these compounds we have uh, taken our superbug strains and what we want to see is in when erythromycin in a superbug type of environment where erythromycin is being expressed if you use erythromycin plus your compound will they become non-resistant right so, um, sorry, I, I, this are, these are results which we are still working on, but we do see very good signs of uh, being able to suppress the resistance. It's still at about 5 micromolar and we have not start, uh, done any pathogenic strains yet, but we have made our own those strains and we have been looking at them. We are having two models, one in which we induce resistance like is in the natural pathogen and one which is constitutively active uh, enzyme. Putting them together, we are trying to refine our inhibitors and hope that we are able to uh, bring some light to this um, this work. With that, I would like to uh, um, summarize that I think I have summarized enough that you need the double flip and inhibitors to that allosteric site is what we are looking at and that's how the recognition happens and you can then have a unique way to actually address this resistance. This resistance is actually um, it, you are not solving the, you are not finding new, new stuff for resistance. You are just tackling the resistance which is already there. So, so if it becomes resistant, I am going to find new drugs. We are not doing that. What we are doing is, there is resistance why this uh, became a superbug. Can we stop its superbug activity just there and use old antibiotics? That's what we are trying to do here. So with that, I would like to stop my talk and my students obviously are really the... Uh, the uh, you know workforce and they help a lot we think together in this problem uh, and uh, some of them have already left now uh, uh, and my collaborators at various stages who have been uh, in this project I've just mentioned and all the funding that is there uh, I have to say this project has funding from Welcome Trust and Stars uh, I'm really indebted to them I have to thank you so much very good talk uh, how conserved are the KSGA like methyl transferases in different bacteria and uh, do we see uh, any uh, so do we see uh, the antibiotic resistance that is occurring uh, how, how much is it due to them and 
Okay, what is okay. That? Let me answer your question a bit more broadly. So there are many kinds of uh, ribosomal methyl transferases, and there are more than one position where a methyl transferase actually methylates a base, and they actually then result in resistance. So um, among different methyl transferases, which go to different positions, they have the same catalytic domain, so they are conserved in that region. But then there are these recognition elements where they are not. So a general ribosomal methyl uh, transferase will be can, conserved can to 30. So they are talking about methyl transferases which are prokaryotic. I mean, or, or all, are, all are in pathogens. All, and yeah, some yeah, of them fine. are in, yes, yeah, 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 only in prokaryotes, in bacterial ribosomal methyl transferases we are talking. We are just uh, uh, like focused there as of now. Even when they are uh, eukaryotic and if they have Rossman like fold, at least 20% conservation will be there because their mechanism is exactly the same. So uh, KSGAs uh, uh, are uh, not actually pathogenic, they are, uh, they are uh, the um, methyl transferases which are involved in biogenesis, they are very conserved, very very conserved among KSGAs. Across ribosomal methyl transferases, minimum 30 to 40% uh, uh, um, conservation among bacterial ribosomal methyl transferases exist. I, as far as I remember, you are also, instead of doing the inhibitor, which you block, mm -hmm. you are also thinking of inhibiting the flipping, right? Yes. Modifications. Well, yes. How far that has gone? So, the problem that we are, uh, actually we, we are not only doing that, we are stopping the expression of oil itself. Uh, but for inhibiting flipping, the problem is, uh, we are worried that we are going to inhibit flipping of another enzyme because that region that we have about the flipping region is very similar to DNA methyl transferases, RNA methyl transferases, and uh, they don't have that selectivity in that region. So what what we are worried is if we concentrate on that that flipping of the so we are looking at flipping but of the allosteric base, not of the active site because we are worried that we are going to have cross inhibition. That's why. So you are sure that only dimethylation would make a resistance or, or what happens? Even monomethylation is resistance. So uh, what happens is then bacteria... Or automatically, so, once you have monomethylated, will automatically also become dimethyl. I mean, it's next no, no, step. there are monomethylases and dimethylases. That's another huge area of research where how does one get mono and then it goes back in and does another reaction. We are looking at that. Actually, that flipping question of this site is more to that uh, way. But, uh, but generally, when you have a superbug type of uh, status taken, then what these bacteria don't want methylation. Because if you have methylation, their own protein uh, machinery is slow. So only then the drug comes after about uh, 10 hours, you will start feeling the resistance. Because then they will be like, oh, there's no option. Let's methylate. We're done. Okay, so they will start methylating mono means, okay, resistance. Uh, Di means they are compromising their own protein synthesis to survive. So die will only happen when there is like huge problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think all of us would uh, agree to the very, very, very beautiful talk.